All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 20th day in January, Saturday, in the year of our Lord, 2024. Uh, it's interesting that Christianity is dying in the West, in the United States. But apparently there's a revival or a birth of Christianity, although there has been Christianity in the past there, in, guess where, Iran. There's a revival of genuine Christianity in, in Iran. And genuine Christianity, uh, you'll see it in places like Iran, Vietnam, communist China, places like that. Because they understand. They understand the meaning of take up your cross and follow me. They understand what Christianity really is, as opposed to in the West, we have so much Christianity that is not really Christianity at all. Uh, so much false Christianity, empty Christianity, dead religion. And I happened to run across a video by a, a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor who did a video on is Christianity a relationship or a religion? I found this interesting because it confirms my experience in Lutheranism before God saved me. And uh, some other things that having recently looked into Lutheranism and looked at the things that I was taught as a young person and what things are being said today, I knew when I looked into it, in spite of the, the fact that I think they have a, a deeper worship than you find in uh, conservative evangelicalism, not even counting the charismatic stuff. That's fake worship, in my opinion, and I've seen enough of it close up and personal, been part of enough of that kind of stuff to uh, have serious doubts about it. But uh, the, so much of what call, is called Christianity today is not Christianity at all. It is just religion. It is just dead religion. And that's why people are leaving the churches, because they've never known Christ. They've never known the power of God's salvation. Uh, that, that's why apparently they're making movies in the United States about the last revival in the United States, which was the Jesus movement, sometimes called the Jesus revolution or the Jesus freaks or whatever. That was the last revival in the United States. Hasn't been, everything since then has been fake. In fact, the Second Great Awakening was fake, too. What's the difference between real revival or real coming to life? It's not really revival. It's being born from the dead. It's resurrection is what it is, spiritual resurrection. The difference is between dead religion and having a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, as Paul puts it. So we're going to listen to this video and think it might be. I'm going to try to enter, uh, to restrain myself and uh, bridle my tongue and maybe only interrupt once when he refers to a scripture passage and then talk about it at the end. So we'll watch. This is seven and a half minutes long. We'll watch about six and a half minutes of it, I think. To give him a chance, I want to let him present it fully, including at the end he sort of redeems himself, but then we'll have a discussion about it. Question comes from 
Rebecca, who asks, oh. I hope you'll speak on the cliché. Ex excuse me. That's so common in Christianity. Stop, stop. Oh, I hate this stuff. Okay, whoops. Let me go back. Okay, I, I've, I've got to switch my sound over. I, I'm a one-man band here, so... All right, so we're going to try it again now. Otherwise, it'll be weird. The question comes from Rebecca, who asks, I hope you'll speak on the cliché that's so common in Christianity, namely that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Ooh, it's a good one. This is all the time people are saying this. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. No. No, there's so many things that are, that are wrong with, with this statement, that Christianity is not a religion, not a relationship. But we want to say, so let's, so, okay, so let's start with being generous about what do people mean when they're talking about this, when they say Christianity is, is not, it's a re, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. What they mean, what I think what they're getting at, it's not all about the rules, it's about the person. It's not all about it's not just about keeping this list of rules it's about the love of God in Christ. Now insofar as that is what they mean there's a kernel of truth in there. It's like it's getting towards the distinction between law and gospel. Remember the laws, the 10 commandments, the gospel is the promise of forgiveness won for us by the death of Jesus on the cross. And these are two doctrines that the scripture gives now they're both true. There are rules that we are supposed to keep, and the not keeping of those rules is precisely why Jesus had to die. That's law and gospel. But people, when they, when people, I, so I think they're trying to push at that, at that something or other when they say it's not a, it's not a, a, a religion, it's a relationship. But it just doesn't, it doesn't get it. But it, le it lets us push it at what is the major picture of salvation that people have when they think about theology. Now, this is good. the relationship becomes a picture for American evangelical identity, and, and it'll be good to have something to contrast it with. So we want to think first about, let's take like medieval Catholicism, medieval Romanism. They had a, a, a strong banking metaphor of what salvation was. So you had True. merit, and there was a treasury of merit in heaven, and it was applied to you on earth. When you did good works, you submit, when you sinned, your bank account went down. And if you died with a negative bank account, you went to hell. If you died with an overflowing bank account, you were a saint. And if you died somewhere in the middle, you had to go to purgatory to make up the difference. So there's this sort of like strong banking metaphor. The Reformation came along and said, no, the picture of the Scriptures is of a court. There we are sitting in judgment. And another has come to, to redeem us, to pay the price that we owed. And it was not gold or silver. It was his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. So that Christ is our redemption. And we are declared to be holy and righteous by this judge. That's the doctrine of justification. Now, the modern evangelical picture of Christianity is of a, like a high school dance. It's a day to, it's a, this is what, this is what's going on. This is behind the idea. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And, and so you're, there's Jesus, and, and he's asked you out, but now you have to decide if you're going to go with him or not. You have to accept his invitation, and you have to, and, and, and everything becomes absorbed in this idea of the relationship, the dating almost relationship, so that, for example, all, the piety of American evangelicalism is, is captivated by this idea, so that so that prayer, for example, you're, you'll hear this, uh, prayer is a two-way conversation. We talk to God, and he talks back to us, and we have to spend time listening. And how we hear God is, I don't know, so it's on the inside or something like this. Uh, uh, even our, okay, our, he does, um, uh, our devotions are called our quiet time. Where I he, he doesn't know, and then he's repeating evangelical cl cliches. Uh, I want to respond a couple things. First of all, he's right about the Catholic idea of a bank account. It's still the Catholic idea of grace is like a substance, like a currency. And if you die with, with a bankrupt account, you go to hell. If you die short of, a, of the proper amount, the necessary amount of grace to pay for all your sins, a uh, necessary amount of good works and penance, then you go to purgatory to pay off your debt for 10,000 or 100,000 or a million years. Who knows? Who knows? If you die in a state of mortal sin, your, your account is bankrupt. 
because you've lost all your accumulated grace and you go to hell. That's that's it. But if you if you got a full if you got a full account, more than a full account, then you've got excess great grace, and that's given to the church to distribute as they please. Because you're you've you've gone beyond what Jesus did on the cross. See, his his grace is not sufficient. And well, it's not sufficient for Lutherans either. But so the the dating metaphor, I've used that metaphor uh, properly, uh, preaching because it is like a uh, salvation is like a uh, a dance, not a date, but a dance. Uh, say a, a high school dance, where the young man and it has he starts with him. Women, uh, young women are not allowed to go invite someone to dance with them, historically. The young man invites a young lady to dance with him. And then if she um, uh, receives his offer, his request, his invitation, then she dances with him. He leads, she follows. And Christianity is like that. More properly, it could be explained as a marriage. The man proposes, and the woman can receive his proposal or not. And if they, he receives his, her, uh, she receives his proposal, they enter into a covenant of marriage that is permanent. And they live together, united, the two become one flesh. As the scripture says, that uh, real Christianity is like that. The two, the the Savior and his the one who believes in him are united and become one spirit. So that it's even more. It is permanent and much more intimate and binding than any earthly marriage. Well, back to the video. But I wanted to get to. Uh, now, so the idea, yes, there has been perversions in recent years. The idea of Jesus is my boyfriend uh, was a temporary genre of religious crap that is, you know, popular, even popular Christianity. P PCC, popular Christian crap. Yes, when I had a bookstore, of course, no books like that were ever allowed in the bookstore. Probably one of the reasons I went out of business because I didn't sell what people wanted. No, I wouldn't sell stuff like that. In this intimate alone time with God, our faith almost, I think the understanding of faith in American Christianity is almost as an emotion. It's a feeling. He does not understand faith. Uh, emotions are not the issue at all. True faith will produce emotions at times. It could be good emotions or bad emotions. But it is a result of the relationship. It is not the relationship itself. This man should know this. Uh, he's, he's arguing against something, uh, deliberately arguing against it, foolishly. Uh, a relationship always produces emotion. A relationship with your wife produces emotion. Relationship with your children or your parents produce emotions, but they are the emotions are not the relationship. They're a consequence of the relationship. This man should know this. He is just arguing deceitfully or ignorantly. He is not a based on his study here. I wouldn't say he's an ignorant man. He's just being a bit deceitful. I think. Or covering his rear side. I don't know why. Well, because he's a devotee of religion rather than relationship. Of nearness to God and worship becomes this experience of feeling the presence of God. Okay, when you are in a state of worship, you are aware of the presence of God. True. Whether it's an awareness of faith or your awareness because the Spirit of God dwells in you and you are worshiping God, and that is a reciprocal relationship. God does not ignore those who, it is a relationship of sharing. That's why true communion is an act of worship and faith and hope 
and love because it's a relationship. It is, the thing itself is unimportant. It is the bridegroom and the bride spending a little private time together in memory of what the bridegroom did for the bride, purchasing her with his own blood. That's worship, if you approach it in the right mind. If you don't approach it in the right mind, then you are doing it improperly. Sacraments apart from a relationship mean nothing. So you can partake of communion and be dead in trespasses and sins. Happens all the time. But do, do you belong to Christ and does he belong to you? That is a relationship, dear reverend pastor. Being swept away in these sorts of things. Now, here's four reasons why this saying that Christianity is not a religion but a relationship, this, this is four reasons why it's bad and it's not helpful. First, religion is in fact a biblical world while relationship is not. Religion is mentioned in James chapter 1, 26. Uh, those who would, religion that's righteous before God is this, to care for orphan widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So reli religion is a biblical word, while relationship is not. In really? Well, it depends what translation you look in. If you look in the NIV or the NLT, you will find the word relationship. I've heard others use this exact same argument, including Roman Catholics. This is the most absurd argument in the world. Because a particular English word isn't used in the translation that he uses, which is probably the ESV, which is not a particularly good translation either, but that is, that is a bogus argument. That's the kind of argument a Jehovah's Witness would might use. That, that would be like arguing with a Jehovah's Witness and say, since the name Jehovah doesn't exist in well, the ESV, therefore Jehovah doesn't exist. Is there a flaw in that argument? Yeah, a big flaw. Okay, so are there words used in the translations or in the Greek that indicate something that is a relationship, especially a particular kind of relationship? It is filled with words like that. So, like, a disciple and teacher, is that a relationship? Yes. Abiding in, Christ talking about uh, you must abide in him. Is that a relationship or is that religion? That's a relationship. Uh, following him, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Another they will not follow. Is that a religion or a relationship? But let's take a look at the very verse he cites. First of all, let me point out that James, uh, this is rather ironic that a Lutheran pastor would cite James, because Luther called the epistle of James an epistle of straw. He meant by that there is no gospel in the epistle of James, and he is correct. There is no gospel in there. If you want to preach the gospel, you don't go to James. Because James is a little—he's uh, not an apostle to start with. He has no authority in the church. He is not an apostle. So James' book has to be subordinated to the apostles. Uh, so if you, if you can't establish that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, that's the Old Testament prophets, particularly speaking about Christ and the promises of Christ, and— Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that's what the church is built on. It's not built on the book of James. It's not built on Ecclesiastes. It is not built on the book of Job. Um, what else? I can't think of two other many. Uh, book of Hebrews. You know, the, the writer of Hebrews, as far as we know, probably wasn't an apostle. I think he was probably a polis. But a, uh, the book of Hebrews is all grounded in the Old Testament prophets, uh, what they say about Christ. So it has the, that, that is in the book of the New Testament. Matthew somewhat too, uh, but Matthew was an apostle. But so uh, 
Hebrews is thoroughly grounded in God's word in the uh, in the scriptures in the Old Testament, referring to the Messiah, referring to Christ in the gospel. So that's where that that book's authority comes from, and it's very similar to Paul. So you have, when you look at other things, you have to verify that. You know, it's like James, if he's not saying the same thing the Apostle Paul says, or the Apostle John, um, you have to interpret James in a way that conforms to the authoritative books of the New Testament. James has no authority. Just because something's in the Bible does not mean it is the Word of God. Who is speaking? Is it God speaking or someone else? Special issue if you want to quote from Job. Most of the quotes I've heard from Job are actually quotes from one of Job's friends, not God. Even Job's words are not God's words. God's words are God's words. So here, James, verse uh, 26 will be sufficient here. Uh, if I'm going to read from the New King James, if anyone among you thinks he is religious— and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is useless. So the word religion there is the word uh, threskia. And so what I'll do is I'll do a quick search on that word, and I'll look at the lemma in the Greek, in other words, the root word, which is nice thing about you can... Uh, so you, you're looking at all the forms of that word without simply a particular form, which is what I want to do here. So that word is used only four times in the New Testament, the word religion. So he's going to base an entire religion on a word that only occurs four times in the New Testament, rather than words of relationship like hope, hope faith, trust, which is faith, and love. And words like follow me, abide in me, things like that. So you're going to have a religion. So how is this word used other than by James? Again, James uses it twice. Um, so let's go to the other usages. It's used by uh, quoting Paul in Acts 26.5. And this is what we see here. They knew me from the first. That, by the word, that's the word foreknown. Uh, Calvinists are big on that. So Paul is using that very word here, foreknown, referring to the Pharisees knew Paul when he was still a Pharisee. So foreknown doesn't mean before anything existed necessarily. It just means known in the past. He previously, they previously knew me. Uh, and if they were willing to testify, because this was a court proceeding uh, before, uh, who was it? The Roman guy there. <laughs> uh, Herod Agrippa was present, I remember that. Uh, the, the, that, accord, uh, that according to the strictest, strictest sec, uh, sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So the word religion is used there. And let me verify that. That's, yeah. According to the strictest strictest sect, the Pharisees. I lived as a Pharisee. So that, that's the religion he's referring to. The religion of the Pharisees or the religion of Judaism. Judaism. So uh, you want to follow Judaism? There's actually a word for that used in the New Testament, too. It's literally Judaism, the religion of the Jews, and a particular sect, the sect of the Pharisees. You want to be a Pharisee? Well, if you want to follow rules, especially man-made rules, like the Book of Concord, where's the Book of Man-Made Rules? Where did I put that? There it is. It's really hard to lose this one. So, in order to be a Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, oh, this guy 
has to swear allegiance to this book. He has to swear he'll never teach anything other than what is taught in this book, which is the traditions of the Lutherans through 1578 or 1580. So that's just, he has, he's sworn he's to uphold this book. Not this book, this book. This is true Lutheranism. This is the Gospels in this book. All right, so. It's used of the Pharisees, the religion of the Pharisees, or Judaism, in Acts 26, 5. What does that have to do with Christianity? Nothing, nothing. Christians don't keep the law. We don't have to keep the law. There was a, a council in Jerusalem the first church council took place, and the church decided, the Holy Spirit convinced them, that the Gentiles don't have to keep the law of Moses. They don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Luther laid the Ten Commandments on thick and heavy. What's interesting, okay, I'll, I'll deal with that later. So let's go on to Colossians. This is the other usage. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels. That's the word uh, theskia, right there, threskia. Religious worship of angels. And you can see Strong's uh, definition over my head there. Religious worship, especially external, that which consists of ceremonies, like sacramental Christianity, like Lutheranism, like Roman Catholicism, like Anglicanism, high Anglicanism, high Lutheranism. There, uh, and Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is high Lutheranism. There is also evangelical Lutheranism. There's also charismatic Lutheranism. There's also apostate Lutheranism. <laughs> It comes in various shades and forms, and some of them are much more evangelical, much more emphasis on a personal relationship with God. In fact, pietism was a very strong movement on, in the United States, and it originated in Germany with a man named uh, Arndt and a man named Spenner, a reform movement to because Lutheranism became dead scholastic religion, nothing but theology. And they were saying, no, you have to have a living faith. You have to have a personal faith. You must be born again. But this is the kind of Lutheranism that is being suppressed now, especially by certain denominations, like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. It basically died as a result of the Civil War in the United States. They got uh, too involved in politics and culture and culture wars, and they burned themselves out. Of course, that was the time of the Second Great Awakening, too, which was all involved in those kind of things in a very great degree. And, well, that wasn't a true revival at all. But pietism was much more biblical than scholastic Lutheranism, which is just dead religion, just theology. Theology can't save anyone. Only a personal relationship with Jesus Christ can save you. Anywhere in the Bible, and personal relationship is nowhere to be found in the Scriptures. Most Christians use that. Okay, a personal relationship. Jesus says, come follow me. What is that? Religion? Take up your cross and follow me. What's that? My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. What is that? Unless you love me more than you love your father and mother and children and wife and your possessions you, uh, and your own life, you cannot be my disciple. What is that? He's calling us to a relationship, not a dead religion. I, I, I'm sorry, I just cannot bridle my tongue because I'm not religious.
idea of a personal relationship so often you would think it would be on every page of the Bible. It's nowhere, it's nowhere to be found. So that's the first critique. The second a, a critique, personal relationship is nowhere to be found in the Bible. This man is either utterly ignorant of the Scriptures or he's being less than truthful. I don't want to call him an, a bald-faced liar. I think he's self-deceived. Or he has a grudge or something. To say that a personal relationship with Christ, yeah, it should be on every page in the Bible. It is. In the Old Testament, you didn't have a personal relationship with God, with Christ, because of something called sin. And then Jesus dealt with that on the cross once and for all. But Lutherans, they want to keep the Ten Commandments. Turn, they, they dig up the Ten Commandments that were buried with Christ, and they keep resurrecting the Ten Commandments. So they have this law gospel thing. I thought that was a distinction between the law and the gospel. No. It is a daily thing I grew up with. You sin daily, and you ask God to forgive you before you go to sleep. And you sin the next day, same thing. You, uh, you, you'd sin and rinse, sin and rinse. Uh, it's a repetitive cycle, never ending, because there is no deliverance from the power of sin in Lutheranism, in this kind of Lutheranism. If you are a slave of sin, you remain a slave of sin. You remain a sinner, someone who practices sin. But you're a forgiven sinner, at least until you sin again. That's why they have to keep going back to communion all the time in order to get another helping of grace that doesn't actually have the power to deliver them from the bondage of sin because they don't understand the promises of God. It's mostly ignorance. It's mostly ignorance. And the preachers don't preach the New Covenant. They don't preach the true gospel. They preach religion. Modified Roman Catholicism is all Lutheranism is. It's, it's, it's Catholic light. No penance, no confession to the priest, and no pope. <laughs> That's about the difference right there. And not quite so many rules. But if you got the Ten Commandments, well, you still got the law hanging over you all the time. Whereas Christ fulfilled the law and Paul, you see, when you contradict the Apostle Paul that says, we are not under the law. He that is in Christ has died to the law. The law has no authority over you. The Ten Commandments have no authority over you. You can't break the commandments because you're not under them. You're under Christ. Okay. Let's see if I can go on here. Not too much time left. ...is this, that Christianity, in the idea that, that Christianity is not a religion but a relationship, it reduces Christianity to an emotional experience. How is a, a relationship reducible to an emotional experience? No comprendo. How is a relationship reducible to an emotional experience? Now, you can have an emotional experience without a relationship, indeed. And you could confuse that with perhaps getting saved. If you listen to really, really bad preachers, rather than read the Bible, but you cannot say that a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is a reduction of Christianity to something less than what it really is. No, religion is a denial of the gospel. Religion, what we do, our works, what John, uh, James was talking about, doing those things in order to be right with God, now that is a denial of the gospel. No, if you're right with God, you will do things like that. You will bear fruit because Christ is in you. He, and God is at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. 
So they're not really our works at all. They're God's works. Which means we can't boast in them, can we? But without that, all you can do is dead works. Because the spiritually dead only produce dead works. It is, Christianity is an emotional experience. There is a joy and a delight. The joy in Christianity is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not an emotion. Love for God is not an emotion. God's love for us is not an emotion. It's something far beyond that. Confusing love and joy uh, with, with emotion is just foolishness. Dogs have emotion. Animals have emotion. That is of the flesh. It's not of the spirit. Love, hope, and faith, these things abide even beyond death. They're not emotions. Emotions don't be, abide typically beyond the day. You're angry today and you're not tomorrow. I hope. I hope. Otherwise, it's a grudge. Light that we have in being Christians, in being loved by God, in having our sins forgiven. But it is... Okay, if, if being loved by God is simply having your sins forgiven, you have a very reductionist gospel, an impoverished gospel. Forgiveness is only one of the gifts of the new covenant. And not the most important one, but it certainly is necessary. But it doesn't, forgiveness does not get you beyond being a sinner and loving sin. It leaves you a sinner. It leaves you a forgiven sinner, which is not what we need. We need to die to that stuff and be reborn as the children of God. New creatures, new creations that do not sin. And indeed, even though sin still dwells in our mortal body for a person that's born again, that new creation that God has put in you that is literally joined to him, your spirit being joined to the spirit of God and Christ dwelling in you, the spirit of Christ in you, that does not sin. Your flesh sins and it catches us unaware at times. But that is this outer shell that's going to perish anyway. But that which is in us is eternal. Those who have believed on Christ, he says, he that believes in me has eternal life because he's in us. To know God is to have eternal life. Do you know God? Do you belong to him? You belong to Christ. If you don't know God, you don't have eternal life. At least not yet. So much more than that. It, 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 it claims every single part of ourselves and of history. So at this idea that Christianity is not a religion but a relationship is a reductionary move. The third No, the other way around. Uh, see, our relationship, history is irrelevant, okay? Our relationship with God is personal. It's his relationship with us individually. The church is simply a composite idea. It's like a nation. A nation has no identity of its own apart from the people that compose it. So it is with the church. It is built up of Christians, living stones, as Peter says, being built up into the temple of God. It doesn't have an objective existence apart from the living stones. God's relationship with you is personal. It's not impersonal. It's only personal. He died for you personally. He did not die for an abstract idea. In fact, it's said in the book of Revelations that he'll give us a new stone 
with our name written on it, or a new name. He'll give us a new name. I might be conflating the stone and the name there. A new name, a personal name given to us by God, not by our earthly parents, but by God. That seems pretty personal, doesn't it? A new name that only God knows and you know. That's it. Third reason it's bad is that it lets unbelievers off the hook. If you, if you say, hey, do you have a relationship? Wait a minute. A personal, have to, requiring a person to have a personal relationship with God, telling him unless you have that, you're not saved, lets, lets unbelievers off the hook. What kind of hook is that? With Jesus, there's an assumption that it's possible to not have a relationship with Jesus. But everybody has a relationship with Jesus. He is either your Savior or your judge. The unbeliever who doesn't know Jesus has a relationship with him. It's just a very, very bad relationship. Okay, because they're a relationship. So he's conflating. I heard Roman Catholics use exactly this argument on exactly this subject. I don't know who got the argument from whom. Okay, you can say in a arbitrary or intellectual or philosophical thing that everything exists in relationship to all things. And everything is, because God is our creator, Christ is our creator, we all have a relationship with God as our creator and him and ourselves as his creature. But it's a kind of relationship we're talking about here, not relationships in general. So this argument is about the stupidest argument I've ever heard from anyone. It'd be like the argument, because, because uh, the ESV doesn't contain the name Jehovah, therefore Jehovah doesn't exist, you know? Stupid argument. So the relationship between a saint, all those who are born again are the saints, the children of God, is that the same kind of relationship between a sinner, a rebel, Someone who does not trust in Christ personally and God? No. No, that's a relationship between a sinner and the judge. Christians are never, ever called sinners in the Scripture. Uh, Paul does once. He uses a present tense, but he uses that as an, uh, to emphasize what he was, not what he is. To say that Paul loves to sin. See, a sinner in the Bible is someone who practices sin, who loves sin. If you're born again, you don't practice sin and you don't love sin. You despise it. And you despise yourself for doing it. That's one of the promises of the New Covenant, too. So, But this is just ridiculous because relationships exist between all things. Therefore, a personal relationship with God is just like all the other relationships. Really? This guy took theology, I assume. Uh, he, uh, didn't he study Aristotle and problems like categories? We are not in the same category as unbelievers, as sinners. We are not properly called sinners, unless you're a Lutheran then you remain a sinner, as I did before I was saved by Jesus Christ, by Christ's death on the cross, when God called me to his son personally. There was no one else present in the room except me and the Holy Spirit. And he showed me the truth that Jesus Christ died for my sins, all of them, past, present, and future through trust in him. See, I received the gospel, I embraced the gospel, and I was born again. Because I needed the gospel, because I was a sinner. But am I a sinner like I was then anymore? No. Do I still sin? Yes, as Paul says too. It's in my mortal body. But only as long as I'm in this mortal body. 
And the fourth reason this is not helpful is because it confuses law and gospel. The main... Okay. So it's not helpful to, to tell a person they have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. You have to trust in him. You have to believe that he rose from the dead, that he is the son of God, and he died for your sins. Why else would you trust in him? I mean, you need, a, you need to be saved. Because the Holy Spirit's already convinced you that you're not. See, he convinced me that just because I was baptized as a Lutheran and been confirmed and, and been part of the Lutheran church, that doesn't make me a Christian. How did he convince me? He showed me my son. Yeah, and it was me in your face. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. And he said, you're not, you know, convince me. I No, I need a Savior. I need Christ. I don't have Christ. And I didn't. Never had prior to that. The problem that we have is not that, like, Jesus is, wants to date us and we're kind of standoffish on the corner. Again, that is using a particular aberration of some women writers uh, that were expressing things in a bad way. Women aren't supposed to be teaching in the church anyway. There's a reason for that. The reason for that. So because you can find Christian books teaching everything. I can find all kinds of heretical Christian Lutheran authors and theologians. Recent ones. Some very popular ones. Uh, Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer. Evangelical hero. He was a heretic. He was a heretic. He, did, he renounced his original uh, book... Uh, uh, what was it, uh, on discipleship, he renounced that later and said Christianity needs to grow up. It gets needs to grow up beyond its dependence on Christ, on God. You didn't hear Bonhoeffer say that, did you? I'm quoting him from memory, so. But yes, he said Christianity needs to grow up. Get over this God idea, basically. Of course, he engaged in culture war and uh, was indirectly involved in the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler and was executed for that. Not executed for being a Christian, executed for being involved in the attempt to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Let's keep things distinct here in the proper categories. Bonhoeffer, yeah, and others. I could find all kinds of them. So would that be fair to, to say that, that he believes the same trash, the neo-Orthodox trash that Bonhoeffer believed? Neo-Orthodoxy, there's a whole lot of trash there. That wouldn't be quite fair, would it? So to dig up the, uh, the dating Jesus as my boyfriend kind of stuff. I don't think it actually got terribly sexual, though. But uh, that's not unusual in Christian history, too. Uh, mystics, especially women, often had ideas like that, romantic ideas about Jesus. Jesus, our, our husband. Some people even apply, uh, <laughs> well, how many Christians have said that uh, What's the, the book in the Old Testament? Uh, uh, the Song of Solomon is about Christ and the church and their love for each other. It's a bit graphic, but a bit central, a bit romantic. So <laughs> I'm sure they could use that to justify that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Our main problem is not this emotional distance from God. Our main problem is that we're sinners. No, 
Not if you're in Christ, you're no longer a sinner. Unless you're a Lutheran, then you remain a sinner. So are you only forgiven until you sin the next time? Like Church of Christ, like, like Catholics? Of course, they've got a bank account, so unless they more mortally sin, they, it just runs slow, slowly down. I don't know, how does that work with Lutherans? The Lutherans have venial sins and, and uh, mortal sins. I even saw that Lutherans have a rosary. So what is it, just our, all our fathers or what? <laughs> I'm not making this up. That we truly do deserve God's wrath, his eternal punishment for our sins. Not anymore. If, you've been, if, if you're in Christ, you don't deserve God's wrath. See, apparently for Lutherans, because they're never born again, they're never actually in Christ. They've never been delivered from the bondage of sin. But they're just forgiven over and over and over and over and over again. That How is it different than the Old Testament? It's really Old Testament religion. Law and sacrifice, law and sacrifice, the never-ending sacrifice for the never-ending sin. Now, I don't believe in sinless perfection in this life, but the new creation that's in you, it does not sin, as the Apostle John says in his first epistle. And Paul talks about the sin that abides in our mortal body in chapter 7 of Romans. It says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, starting in chapter 8, in Christ Jesus. There's a distinction, though, between the new creation and this body of clay. And just temporal punishment. We, we deserve nothing good from God. We are... Well, nobody deserves anything good from God. That's not why God gives. Parents, Jesus compared it to a parent. He said, if, if you being evil, know how to, do, and by the way, you need to look up the, the meaning of that word evil because it uh, it actually means toilsome and restless and busy. It's, it's rather, uh, it, it's not necessarily moral evil. It's strange, strange uh, way how they get that word to mean that. But Or, or we just have a distorted idea of some words. Uh, but, but a parent, why does a parent give good things to their children? Do they deserve it? Of course not. Because it's the nature of the parents and their parents' love. It has nothing to do with merit, although you might give good things to your children to help train them, like you do an animal, reward it for good behavior and, and not give it something for bad behavior, you know. And we use a little bit of that with our children. But when it comes down to it, do you love your children because they're good, or do you love your children because it's because you love them? It is not a matter of, you know, the idea of grace is sort of strange. It's not, it's, it's just in contrary to works is what it is, it is what God gives us freely. It's a relationship with God that is free. It is a father and his children. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? I don't know. I don't think all Lutherans are quite this bad. We are his enemies, and yet Jesus has taken... I'm not God's enemy. Pastor Wolfmeyer, are you still God's enemy? You need to repent and be saved. You haven't been reconciled with him from, from yourself? You're, you're still an enemy of God? You're still a vicious sinner who loves to sin? 
You need to look at the promises of the new covenant and start claiming those for your own because you need them. You need a new heart and a new spirit. A heart that's not at enmity to God. Doesn't Paul talk about that? Like in Ephesians and well, a whole lot of the, of the epistles. You once were children of disobedience, but now have become. Yes, Pastor Wolfmeyer. So apparently Lutherans don't believe the New Testament. That's what happens when you go by your, your tradition rather than the Word of God. When you go by religion rather than by the relationship God has established with his people. And he's given, the, told us about that relationship and his love for us in the epistles especially. He has, has, has taken our sin upon himself to die on the cross for our sins True. so that he can he can deliver to us the the grace and goodness of God that he can True and that was done 2000 years ago forgive our sins that he can cleanse us from all unrighteousness that he can declare us to be that he can give us the gift of his perfection that he can give us his name and his spirit and his kingdom and the sure promise of eternal life and the Have you got that already or are you still waiting for it to be delivered and when will, when will that be? So is this only promises for after you physically die, or is it for present possession? When the scripture in John 3, 36 says those who believe have, present tense, eternal life, which means you also know God, but you don't seem to know God because you make fun of that idea. <sighs> What can I say? Oh, yes. I knew there might be some roadblocks I'd run into when I started investigating the LCMS. A big concrete one right in the middle of the expressway. Quack. Yeah, there was a barrier there. Stop. Do not proceed farther. further. Bridge out. The bridge to God is not present here. Uh, you will end up in the deep six. Resurrection of the body in the new heaven and new earth where the righteous will dwell. I mean, this is so much more than... How about being born again now? See, a lot of that stuff... Okay, then, this we're living in the midst of this world, which is hostile toward God. As his children, we need those promises today. <laughs> Not just after this body perishes. Today, especially when we're living in the Antichrist godless West. <laughs> we don't need religion. We need Christ. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even unto the end. Is that like a personal thing there? Or was it just for the apostles? So how, you don't actually know that he's there? When you pray, does he answer? Or don't you pray for things that would actually have a, a, a testable answer? An uh, intimate personal relationship. This is salvation. And that's the main thing, that Jesus is not our, our boyfriend. Jesus is our Lord and our God and our Savior and our Redeemer. Every term he mentioned there was terms of relationship, personal relationship. He's our Lord, our, my Lord, my God, my Savior. That's personal relationship. He is contradicting himself. That's what happens when you start thinking about things a little bit, start getting a little bit biblical. And that is our religion. Uh, again, uh, characterizing evangelicalism is Jesus is my boyfriend. All right, all right. That is like slander. 
I guess you need to go to confession because some Lutherans do practice that. Go to confession, pray your rosary, whatever the Lutheran rosary is. I, you know, I never heard of such a thing growing up as a Lutheran. Never heard that there was such a thing. I, I do remember some of the priests, I mean, pastors talking about confession that they wish it was still around. Yeah, so they could hear everybody's sins. Yes. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, there, there was one or two of those pastors that ended up with a little bit of a personal relationship with someone in the congregation, too, and for which they were booted out. But that wasn't Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Oh, yeah, there's a uh, th this has to be one of the most absurd videos I've ever heard put out by anyone. I mean, you sort of expect this from Catholics, Roman Catholics. Because they have no choice. I mean, they got to defend Pope Francis. Pope splainers, uh, but you know, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Synod. Well, I guess that does ask, uh, answer a lot of questions for me too. It's like, no, they don't believe in. Although, I'm sure there are some that are born again. But apparently, there's a lot that aren't. Why would you be arguing against that? unless you completely don't understand it because you don't possess it. The idea of Jesus is my boyfriend, yeah, we all make fun of that. All evangelicals make fun of that nonsense. And so this is just attacking what Jesus said in John chapter 3. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. Of course, they believe that happens when you baptize a baby. Didn't work in my case. I was a sinner, and I practiced it. I loved it. I love sin. It's what I wanted. I didn't want Christ running my life. He, he would interfere with that. until I got myself in such a god-awful mess that there was no place to look but up. And then the Holy Spirit came along and confronted me with my sin. Then after I stewed in that for a little bit, he showed me Jesus, my Savior. Christ! The Holy Spirit did. I was called by God without a church outside the church, called on to Christ. I don't have a relationship with your religion. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is my identity, not man-made religion. God doesn't make religion. Man makes religion. The word religion is never used in the New Testament dear pastor, of salvation, of Christ, of what God has delivered us to us in Christ and through his apostles. It never uses that word of true faith in Christ, does it?